I'm going to allow a little bit for folks to come on in. If you'd like, you can get in the chat, changing the setting to everyone so that you can say hello, where you're tuning in from. We'll be able to take questions later. So I'll give everyone the rundown in just another moment. All right, let's get started. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Kay from Greenlight and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Lev Grossman launching his new book, The Golden Swift. So you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just wanna say a huge thanks to Lev and the team at Little Brown for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Now, just a couple of housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and there are a couple of different ways you can interact with our author and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by our author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And importantly, tonight's featured book, The Golden Swift, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. at both our Fulton Street and Flatbush Ave stores where you can purchase Lev's book and many others on site. You can also order online at greenlightbookstore.com. Don't mind my dog for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. I'll drop the buy link in the chat. As thanks for attending tonight's virtual event, we are offering 10% off the featured book. Enter coupon code GREENLIGHTEVENTS10 into the coupon discount section at checkout online for 10% off. And finally, Lev stopped by our store to sign copies of the book this past weekend. So you can get a signed book by request while supplies last. Make sure to indicate your signed copy request in order comments at checkout when ordering online or look for signed copies when you visit our store. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Our featured author tonight is Lev Grossman. Lev is the author of five novels, including The Silver Arrow, and the number one New York Times bestselling Magicians Trilogy, which has been published in 30 countries. A TV adaptation of the trilogy is now in its fifth season as the top rated show on sci-fi. Grossman is also an award-winning journalist who spent 15 years as the book critic and lead technology writer at Time Magazine, where he published more than 20 cover stories. In addition, he has written for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Wired, The Believer, The Village Voice, NPR, Salon, Slate, and BuzzFeed, among many others. He lives in New York City with his wife and three children. Lev's new book, The Golden Swift, is the thrilling sequel to The Silver Arrow, in which Kate and Tom confront the limits of what even magic can do. Lev is going to start us off, and then we'll be able to talk more about the book and answer questions. So without further ado, please take it away, love. Thank, thank you, Kay. Kay, I'm so interested in your dog. Uh, is it the kind of dog you can hold up so we can see? It sounds like a small dog. There, look at that. What kind of dog is that? He's a miniature schnauzer 
and he's one years old. So some one, one year old puppy trying to get involved in the event tonight. Yeah, I would be excited if I were. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, as Kay mentioned, I'm here to talk about uh, a new book called Golden Swift. Um, as a journalist, I feel like I should say, um, for some reason in my biography, uh, it, it, the, the number of books I have written is incorrect. I've actually written six books. And when this comes out tomorrow, the number will be seven, which seems like a huge number of books for one person to have written. Uh, I don't know how it happened, uh, but I will try to explain. Um, uh, the Golden Swift and the Silver Arrow books, um, they started as so many books do um, with a young boy and a dream. I was in eighth grade and my dream was to play a lead in the school musical which um, when I was in eighth grade, that was Oklahoma. Um, and I would have been fine with any lead. I could have been Curly, I could have been Will, I could even have been Judd, who's the bad guy. I could even have been Ali Hakim, who is the very politically not great um, uh, 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 a Persian salesman um, who uh, has some comic turns. Um, really, it's time almost to cancel that musical. Um, but I did not get any of those parts. I was put in the chorus. Um, but did I give up on trying to get a lead in the school musical? No, I did not. The next year, the musical was South Pacific. Um, and I didn't get a lead that year either. The next year, it was how to succeed in business without really trying. And I also did not get a lead in that musical. And the following year, it was West Side Story. I did not get a lead in West Side Story either. In my senior year of high school, the musical was Merrily We Roll Along. I didn't really get a lead, but I did have a song, uh, which I think they gave me out of pity because I had tried for so many years to uh, uh, get a leading role. Uh, I'm not sure what the story, uh, moral of the story is. Uh, I'm not sure that it has one, um, uh, but it's one of the many reasons that I gave up on pursuing a career in singing or really any of the dramatic arts. Um, I have since then pursued dreams of being an English professor, which I gave up and also being a tech support guy, which I also gave up, and even a salesman of novelty bottle openers, which I also gave up after one day. It was just not my calling. Uh, and instead, I became a writer. Uh, and one of the books I wrote is called The Silver Arrow, which is here, uh, which The Golden Swift is the sequel of. In case you don't know it or have read it and are suffering from amnesia, it is about a girl named Kate. She is 11. She has a mysterious uncle named Herbert, who's uh, uh, very wealthy and irresponsible and mysterious. And for her birthday, um, Herbert gives Kate a steam train, and not a toy steam train, an actual working steam train called the Silver Arrow, which is maybe not ideally what she had wanted, but that's what she gets. Um, and later, she's glad she did because she discovers some things about the train, including the fact that it talks, um, although it has a very sarcastic sense of humor. Um, the Silver Arrow also has a purpose. Um, it is part of a whole railway network called the Great Secret Intercontinental Railway, and it runs all over the world, and it has a purpose. And the purpose is to help animals. Now, when I started writing The Silver Arrow, uh, all I was really thinking about was um, I wanted to write a kind of a magical adventure story about trains, and talking animals, uh, a little bit like James and the Giant Peach, except with um, except with a peach instead of uh, a train, rather instead of a peach, um, and all kinds of animals, not just giant bugs. Uh, and uh, that is what I set out to do. And what I found that became really interesting for me is that James and the Giant Peach was published 60 years ago, and uh, a lot has changed since then. Uh, our whole relationship to animals and the natural world is different uh, than it used to be. Um, uh, and as it turns out, animals need a lot of help because it's maybe not the easiest time to be an animal right now. Temperatures are getting warmer and humans are building over animals' habitats and we are hunting them and releasing chemicals into their environment and the seas are getting warmer and the snow and ice are melting. So. Uh, when James meets the giant bugs inside the peach, um, the bugs are actually, they're pretty happy to see him. Um, and he sort of mixes right in with them. 
when Kate meets the animals uh, on the Silver Arrow, um, they're happy to see her, but there's also an element of you have got a lot to answer for. And you may think you are the hero of this story, but we think that maybe you might be the villain. Well, all this plays out in the Silver Arrow, along with a huge amount of candy. And I'll tell you an interesting fact about candy, which I didn't know. If you publish a book in the United States that is about candy, or has candy in it, and then a British publisher buys it and they publish the same book in Britain, they will make you change the candy. You cannot have American candy in your British book. They will take out your Swedish fish and your candy corn because apparently they don't exist in Britain. Um, and in fact, they won't say candy. Instead, they will say boiled sweets. This is an amazing thing that I learned by being a professional author. Uh, this is a long way of saying, um, uh, I really enjoyed writing The Silver Arrow. And when I was done, I wrote a sequel it's called The Golden Swift. And I can tell you, writing a sequel, it's not always easy. Um, and if you are in any doubt about that, I refer you to Roll, back to Roald Dahl, um, specifically to the sequel to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which is called Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator. Um, and it is not as good as Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Um, I invite you to read it, um, but I'm fairly sure you will agree with me. Even the great Roald Dahl struggled to write a, a decent sequel. Um, but I do know about sequels that they have to be bigger and better than the original. Um, and with that in mind, uh, in The Golden Swift, I introduced a whole bunch of new animal char characters. Uh, and I'll tell you about a few of them. Um, one of them is a cassowary. And a cassowary, if you don't happen to know, is a very big bird. Uh, a cassowary weighs about 130 pounds. It is the second heaviest bird in the world after the ostrich. Uh, a cassowary stands about six foot six, which makes it the third tallest bird in the world after the ostrich and the emu. It also lays the third largest egg. But most interestingly, it is the most dangerous bird in the world. Uh, and I'll show you why. A cassowary can leap seven feet in the air. Uh, it can run 30 miles an hour. And it has these. This, you might be interested to know is a 3D printed replica of a cassowary's foot, which goes to show that you can buy almost anything on the internet, even a cassowary foot. Um, a cassowary foot, uh, as you, I will draw in particular your attention to this, which is a claw about three inches long. Um, the cassowary has one on each of its sort of inside sort of big toes, uh, and it uses them to slice things open. Cassowaries are the only bird in the world that are known and documented to have killed a human being. That's not quite true. Ostriches have also killed human beings, but I feel like the cassowary lost out to the ostrich in so many categories that I think we should give this one to them. Most dangerous bird in the world. Uh, in addition to the cassowary, we have a hive of bees because I don't think I was fair to um, uh, uh, the insects in Silver Arrow, there weren't very many of them. So there is a hive of bees in the Golden Swift. I also put them in there because I'm afraid of bees. Very afraid of bees um, because of a, an unfortunate incident that took place in my childhood. Um, and I felt as though one thing you do as a writer, is you try to confront your fears uh, in your books. And that is when I did. Uh, so there's a hive of bees. There's a cod cod, which is the world's smallest wildcat. And that is all I need to tell you to explain why I wanted to put a cod cod uh, in the Golden Swift. Um, and there are also swifts. The swift, you may not know, is the greatest flying animal in the world. Swifts almost never land. When a baby swift leaves its nest for the first time on its very first flight, it will probably not land again for 10 months. Swifts spend almost their entire lives in the air. Um, in the Middle Ages, when they were really bad at science, they used to think that swifts didn't even have feet because nobody ever saw them land. Uh, they are the fastest bird in the world. Um, and before you correct me, I know that peregrine falcons are very fast when they're in their sort of stooping dive mode. But if you had a race, like a level flight from point A to point B, swifts would win every time because they are the fastest birds in the world. and Every year, a given swift will fly far enough that they could go five times around the Earth. It's amazing. Um, 
I also put in uh, Wolverines. Uh, I have another thing to show off here. You can also buy on the internet a Wolverine skull, but they're really expensive. So instead of that, I bought a replica of a Wolverine skull, uh, which this is, and has very scary teeth. Um, I got interested in Wolverines basically because I felt like I knew an incredible amount about Wolverine the superhero, but I know nothing about actual Wolverines. And I can tell you, having studied Wolverines and researched them quite a bit, that there is nothing surprising. There are no just surprising facts about Wolverines out there. They are just these very hairy and fierce little guys, and they smell very bad, uh, and they're very good hunters. Um, the only things that I learned about them that were surprising was one, they are related to weasels, which I did not know. They are the largest member of the weasel family. And two, their scientific name is Gulo Gulo. Gulo Gulo. That's their scientific name. Apparently it means glutton in Latin. And then there is a whole category of animals that are, uh, that are like that, which have the same name twice as their scientific name. It's a thing. Um, and it is now my second favorite animal name, animal scientific name behind the gorilla. And the scientific name of a gorilla is Gorilla Gorilla. Amazing. So along with all these new animals, uh, we introduced a new train, which is the Golden Swift, uh, which is a very cool looking train, which makes the Silver Arrow, the original steam train, very insecure. I don't know if you know this, but around 1930, there was a big revolution in the design of steam trains, which is that they stopped looking like Thomas the Tank Engine and they started looking basically like spaceships. They streamlined them and they looked amazing. And they did that for a little while and then there was World War II and after that, nobody wanted steam trains anymore. But there was a little window right there in the 1930s when steam trains looked amazing. And the Golden Swift is one of those. Uh, there's some new conductors, some new people uh, that Kate meets um, and they have some new ideas about how to help animals. Um, I got very interested in, in the concept uh, of something called rewilding uh, while I was working on the Golden Swift. Uh, and species uh, reintroduction, and I'll tell you how that works. Beavers. Um, you may not know this, but there used to be beavers in Britain, in the United Kingdom, um, until about 400 years ago. Apparently beaver pelts um, are so nice that everybody hunted all the beavers and then there were none left in the UK. British people, very avid hunters. Um, and then everybody basically forgot that there ever had been beavers in the United Kingdom to the point where beavers were reclassified as an invasive species when they were found in the United Kingdom. Um, but as it turns out, there are many ecosystems, many places in the United Kingdom which actually really need beavers quite badly. There are a whole species of trees which are evolved to be gnawed on by beavers as part of their life cycle, and that wasn't happening. Nobody was gnawing on these trees. Likewise, there's a lot of problems with flooding in the United Kingdom, and that is because many areas in the, in the United Kingdom they were they 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 they, they evolved um, uh, to need beaver dams to um, uh, uh, to kind of act as sort of shock absorbers and to absorb the water and keep it from flooding down um, in crazy disastrous ways. Beaver dams create wetlands. Um, they create whole ponds and environments for different kinds of insects uh, and birds. There are many little ecosystems within the United Kingdom which are totally out of balance because they are missing. Uh, one of their keystone species, which is the beaver. Uh, somebody, some several people, have figured that out and are now campaigning very hard to bring beavers back to the United Kingdom. And everybody is very nervous about it. Um, and they are very slowly, in these very controlled trials, reintroducing beavers um, uh, into the United Kingdom. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, very, they're very worried the beavers are going uh, are gonna to escape. Other people, environmental activists, are so excited about having beavers in the United Kingdom that they are doing what's called beaver bombing, which is they're just taking beavers from other countries and releasing them in the wild in the United Kingdom and saying, fly, be free, um, go be a beaver in the United Kingdom because we need you. It's a fascinating thing that's happening. And it's happening with so many different species all around the world, including lynxes. Uh, scientific name, lynx lynx. It's another one of those. Uh, lynxes in Scotland is a very hot political issue, but there used to be lynxes there and now there aren't, and they're trying, some people are trying, to bring them back. Um, Kate uh, and her new friends uh, try a little bit of that. Um, they experiment with this kind of way to help animals, um, and in some cases they are very successful. And in other cases they run into um, unintended consequences. What they discover is that nature is incredibly complicated. 
And every part of nature is connected to every other part of nature. And so if you change one little one, all the others get changed too, sometimes in ways that you don't expect. Um, and you come to realize that many of the environmental disasters that we have seen in the last few hundred years uh, were originally well-intentioned uh, interventions in the natural world by humans, and they didn't work out the way we thought they would. That happens to Kate. Um, and Kate also tries to get a lead in her school musical, which is Anything Goes. Um, and she tries out and she's very bad at singing and she doesn't get a lead and she gets put in the chorus and she has to face that difficult fact. Um, and I guess one of the, more, the morals of that story is sometimes if you are really bad at singing, it's okay to stop trying. Um, but it's not okay to stop trying to help the environment. Even though there's all these unintended consequences, it's so difficult to make sense of it uh, and to make things happen the way you want them to. Um, we have to keep trying. So that's the Golden Swift. Uh, and I'd be very happy if there are any questions in the chat. Uh, personally, I'm very poor at asking questions in this situation, so I, I would understand if there weren't any, but if there are any, uh, I'm very happy to answer them. Well, I don't see any questions in the chat yet, but there might be soon. Uh, thank you for sharing with us the sounds of New York City. Uh, thank you for sharing with us some about your new book. I'm going to let folks know now. You can choose to put your questions in the chat if you would like, or the Q&A module. It's empty right now, but maybe you want to put a question in. It's the icon with two speech balloons. Hey, I led with the q a module i should have mentioned that right up front i didn't even know such a module existed and now i know i mean listen we've been doing zoom for two years two two years and and we're all still learning we're all still learning uh so lev the concept of rewilding in kids literature um i can't say that i'm seeing a lot of overt environmentalism, but I've noticed as an event host and um, leading some story time books with, with kid, young, young kids and some more intermediate books as well, that environmentalism is slowly creeping in. Was that an active idea you had at the onset of writing these books? Um, I was definitely aware that, um, I, I have children, my kids are, are nine and 11 currently, and I was definitely aware that on the one hand, they were, they know about climate change and some of the environmental problems that um, animals are facing. Um, and they know that it's really widespread and it's going on. It's something very serious. And I also noticed that a lot of the books that they were reading and the TV shows they were watching um, didn't really talk about it. Um, they didn't really mention it. Uh, uh, and there were lots of talking animals around. I think if they really were talking animals, they would not talk about much else besides this, because it's a major thing that's going on for them. Um, but uh, in the stories that they were reading, it just never seemed to appear. And I think that they were, it was confusing. Um, and it was hard for them to kind of integrate that in their sense of, uh, into their sense of what was going on, because stories are kind of how we do that. Um, it's kind of how we organize what's going on around us in the world. Uh, and so I, I thought it was important um, that there be some kind of, literature about this, there should be stories about this. Um, and when I was writing myself, I found myself unable to keep climate change out. Uh, because even though I write about um, magic and things like that, and talking steam trains, um, when it comes to reality, uh, I find that it's the best policy is to be as honest as possible. Um, and so I, I left that stuff in and it becomes part of the story. Yeah, kids are smart, you know, and I feel like in, in fantasy books, as, especially kids literature. I mean, I, I recently read The Golden Compass, a, a kid's book, you know, that is an anti-church book um, that, yeah. and you, you mentioned James and the Giant Peach, and that was one of the early books I read as a child that made me love reading. And I, I think kids are just so quick to pick up on what's going on around them. And I, I love too that you're, you're an adult sci-fi fantasy author. And as I'm sure you well know, like many genre writers, it allows for you to comment on what's going on in the world without maybe beating us over the head with it. Uh, well, it's, it's challenging in, in several ways, including the beating over the head part of it. Um, because when you write a story with the intention of making 
an argument or a point or scolding somebody for having changed the climate. Bad human beings, you should not have changed the climate. Well, it's not that you're wrong, but it just doesn't make her a good story. Um, uh, the story has to be fun and compelling, and it has to be about emotions and people. Um, and then if climate change becomes part of the picture, then the, it, it's all well and good. It's also challenging because it's not like the Wicked Witch. Um, uh, the climate change at the end of the story, you don't defeat climate change at the end of the story. Um, because that, uh, whatever is going to happen to climate change, it's not going to end that way. Um, which, which in some ways makes it a challenging story to tell, because if the villain is, is climate change, um, well, uh, it's still going to be around at the end of the story. So how do you wrap up the story? Uh, what kind of story, what kind of future do you imagine after the end of the story? Um, it's, it's challenging, but in some ways it is the challenge that people who are growing up right now um, have to face. Absolutely. So we're starting to get some questions in the Q&A. So I'm going to read the first one is from Rachel. How did you get the name The Silver Arrow? You know, it's, it's, it's such a good question. Um, uh, um, and I wish I, I wish I had I wish I had a good answer, um, because as I think Kate points out in the book, what good would a silver arrow actually be? Would it be useful to have a silver arrow? Probably wouldn't be a good material to make an arrow out of. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I, I really just thought, um, I thought it would be a good name for a train. And I tried so many different names for trains. Um, uh, and it's funny that I ended up with um, the silver arrow. Um, uh, but um, I, I did the, the, the honest answer is that I liked it. Um, and I will add that if you're interested in buying one of the signed copies of the Golden Swift that is at Greenlight, under my name, I have attempted to draw on each one a little arrow. And if you buy one and you wonder what that doodle is at the bottom <laughs> of the page, it's an arrow. I'm so sorry about <laughs> drawing arrows. The feathers are just, it looks more like fur at the end of the arrows, but it is supposed to be feathers and that's an arrow. That makes it unique. What are some of the other names you thought of? Well, trains have such, have, you know, such good names. They're always sort of they're the comet or the flyer or the post uh, over the um, uh, or the flying Scotsman there, you know, they always, they're, they're, uh, I, I, they're, they're always um, so compelling and kind of evoke, um, 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 I don't know, some, the, uh, uh, the kind of misty age of rail. Well, if you've ever read um, uh, T.S. Eliot's Possum's Book of Practical Cats or perhaps seen the musical Cats, which I never have, and I still don't think I'm ever going to, um, but there's one of the cats called Skimbleshanks, who's the railway cat, and Eliot has a great poem about just how cool it is to, uh, to be Skimbleshanks and to live in a, um, a sleeper car on a train. Um, it's very evocative. I can tell you that as research and also as life experience, I have spent several nights in sleeper cars on sleeper trains, and I am here to tell you they are so hideously uncomfortable. I can't, I can't even, I can't even express it. I, so I can just, you know, I, get the romantic image out of my head of I've the sleeper car. Or a wink uh, in a sleeper car on a train. But in my book, The Silver Arrow and The Golden Swift, sleeper cars on trains are super comfortable because unlike with climate ch change, I don't feel a huge obligation to be 100% honest about sleeper cars. <laughs> You know, yeah. when you were talking about your research that I led know, to sleeper I, cars, I, I thought you were going to tell us your research was auditioning for cats. Yeah. Oh, you that, seem to have a real affinity for musical theater. Well, I do. It does not have an affinity for me. Sad. Okay. I have some more questions here. This question is from Edie, age seven. What is your favorite animal and why? Oh, it's such a good question. Um, uh, I... Um, I'm very fond of whales, very fond of whales. Um, I think if I had to pick a favorite animal and it's hard, um, I would have to, uh, uh, I would have to pick whales, which reminds me that, um, uh, that uh, one of the animals in the, the, um, the Golden Swift, which I didn't mention, there are whales in it. Um, and there is a submarine, there's a whole undersea adventure part of it. And in fact, if you look at the back cover of the book, which you don't have yet probably, but I'm gonna hold it up, you will see there is an illustration of a whale with a train kind of zooming by it. Um, when I saw this illustration, I said, A, I love it, and B, I feel like the whale is too big and the train is too small. Like, 
the relative sizes of those two things are not quite as they should be, but everybody agreed that it looked so cool that they were just gonna leave it as it was, which I'm okay with. Okay, what were your favorite books growing up and have they inspired your writing for either or both your adult and middle grade books? Probably the first book that I really fell in love with was um, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis, um, uh, which um, has been such an influence on me my entire life. Um, and I, it's, it's one of the books that I reread and still am exactly as swept away by it as I was um, when I was a child. Um, the, the little bit in it where Lucy, the youngest Pevensey child, goes through the wardrobe and to Narnia for the first time. I don't know, it might be one of my favorite pieces of writing in the English language. Um, so I read the Narnia books um, a lot. Uh, uh, not as much the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, uh, although I, I did read those. Um, I was very obsessed with Tintin. I don't know if you're familiar with Tintin, the graphic novel about a strangely young Belgian. <laughs> journalist you wouldn't think if someone were pitching that today that it would sound like a, a, an amazing thing um, but I, I read Tintin um, many times over uh, also the Hardy Boys uh, uh, I probably would have loved Harry Potter um, and the Golden Compass if I were not so old that they didn't exist when I was a child but I still love them now that's fair enough that's quite the roster it makes a lot of sense I mean also having read your adult series um the influence there so let's see who else do we have here alexa asks what was the inspiration behind the silver arrows personality and how did you go about thinking about what a trans personality would be <laughs> um you know when i started writing the um the the the, the, the speech of the of the of this the silver arrow when you're writing, sometimes things take you by surprise. It wasn't clear to me until I started writing the book and Kate and Tom started writing in The Silver Arrow that The Silver Arrow could talk. I realized that The Silver Arrow could talk only very briefly right before Kate did because suddenly <clears throat> there was this sort of paper scroll and it started talking to them. Uh, so it was one of those things that kind of took me by surprise and its, it's, it's, it's personality was already there. Um, and. Uh, it was so sort of <laughs> dry and sarcastic, um, and I would, I'd be writing it, and I really enjoyed writing it, possibly because I'm dry and sarcastic myself. But I thought I, I was, I was right. I kept this reminds me so much of somebody that I know. Maybe it's just because I'm such, I have such an amazing imagination, and I've imagined this train, which seems so real. And then I realized that it was talking in the voice of my oldest child, um, who is 17, um, and he, he's a very sarcastic teenager. Um, uh, and um, very world weary and cynical. Um, uh, so that was the inspiration as it turns out for the Silver Arrow. And I didn't even realize it while I was being inspired, which is probably good. Um, but I had now since confessed that to my oldest child, Ross, that he is in fact the Silver Arrow and he was okay with it. Does that mean that your other children will also be trains? <laughs> no, my- Or my other animals? <laughs> Um, I think they would like to be, um, that option is available to them, definitely. Well, speaking of the possibility of others, Michael M asks, will there be more books in the series with multiple question marks and a smiley face? There, def there definitely will be more books. I feel as though, A, I enjoy writing them a lot, and there's a lot of talking animals that I haven't gotten to yet. Um, it, also, you can't really have two books in a series. It, it looks so, it feels like not enough. There should be more. Uh, you have to at least have three. So um, it's coming. Don't worry about that. All right, we, we have some more for sure. How did you get the name Golden Swift? Uh, I, it's so, I'm embarrassed to say that I, I, I really, agonized about the name Golden Swift. It seems just like such a simple name. And yet there are just, in my computer, there are just enormous numbers of lists of adjectives, you know, golden, flying, um, you know, sparkly, I don't know what else. So, and then there was a whole list of nouns, um, you know, the, the Swift, the Flyer, the Post, the Star, 
Um, and I kept rearranging them and putting them next to each other and just trying the different combinations. Um, uh, um, uh, and I was really infatuated with the, the idea of calling a train the wilderness overnight. And at the last minute, I decided it was too many syllables. And so um, we stayed with the Golden Swift, which I like a lot. But I'm not, I haven't given up on the wilderness overnight. I feel it might make, a, might make an appearance. In no. case we're getting some like behind the scenes R and D right now. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So uh, Gabriel asked, "Do you see this series as another trilogy? And what is the current status of the Bright Sword?" Ah, hmm. uh, this is. I just. I'm. 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 I'm holding. I'm holding back tears because I'm so close to finishing the Bright Sword. The Bright Sword actually had. A, it had a it had a deadline. It was due um, on it was supposed to be due by the end of this month. I mean the end of last month, April, which I think was April thirtieth. I think that was Saturday, and I did not turn it in on Saturday, or Sunday, or today. Maybe I'll turn it in tomorrow. It's so close to being done, and then there's this thing. Sometimes when you've been working on something for a long time, and it's hard to let go of it, you start to let go of it, and then you pull it back and think, no, I just want to change one thing. I just want to. If I, I'll just fix this one thing and then you can have it. Um, I keep doing that, um, but it's really close. It's really close to being done. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm really excited about it. Uh, we have a question from Josiah, age six. What's your favorite children's book with animals in it? Hmm. We, well, got, we, we got some overlap here. Yeah, yeah. We've mentioned uh, James and the Giant Peach. Um, uh, and The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, both of which I do like a lot. If I'm being 100% honest, it probably, well, I love The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's definitely one of the Narnia books. It's probably The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. I think it might be. I don't know whether it's fair to count Reepy Cheep, who is a talking mouse. He's a very big mouse, so he's sort of a, <laughs> you know, he's a magic mouse. Um, uh, but I think he's a talking animal. Um, I'm I, anything with Reepy Cheep in it. Um, I am just a, a, a big a big fan of. Um, uh, but there are lots of good ones. Yeah, he, he's still a mouse, even if he's a really big mouse. Uh, so we have from Dustin. Kate is growing up and facing painful truths all the while living in a world where whimsical magic exists. In comparison to The Magicians, which is substantially more adult in theme, how do you feel this translated in the writing of her character arc and growth while keeping it age appropriate? Thank you, Dustin. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, the characters in The Magicians and the characters in the, in the Silver Arrow books, they face the same problems, which is that they live in a world with magic um, and yet the big, big problems of that world um, and their lives are not solvable by magic. Um, we learn a little bit more about the nature of magic in um, the um, in the Golden Swift uh, uh, and in that world. Uh, uh, in that world, the great magicians of the world are not humans, they're animals. The animals are the true masters of magic um, and humans can do a little bit. Um, but the magic of the animals is not really wasn't made to deal with the kinds of problems that humans bring with them. Um, so the big problems can't be solved by magic, um, which is kind of a bittersweet thing. Uh, magic can do lots of cool stuff, um, and I like having it around. Um, but uh, both in The Magicians and Silver Arrow, people are having to realize that the big <sighs> struggles that they have, um, uh, you know, the real thing that they have to master and the challenge they have, um, most of it happens inside them. Um, uh, and the magic is, um, it's fun, but it's not the hard part. The hard part is the real stuff. It's reality. This one's fun from Cora. How did you decide to add whales? <laughs> Everything's better with whales. <laughs> Everything's better. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is better with whales. Um, I, I just, I'm inordinately fond of them. Um, and also towards the end of the Silver Arrow, Uncle Herbert does promise does hint to Tom that he might be getting a submarine. Uh, and I felt as though if I hinted at it, I really ought to make good on that. 
Um, and if someone's going on a trip in a submarine, there's, there's going to be whales involved. There's also whales and the magicians, interestingly. Uh, uh, and they are, whales can also do magic in the magicians. Um, I feel like that's just a universal, that's maybe the universal theme of everything that I write is whale, <laughs> wizard whales. Um, that's really where the different worlds touch. <laughs> Wizard whales. Okay, so if anyone asks me in the bookstore, so what? what's Lev Grossman's work like? Oh, I'll be like, well, do you know anything about wizard whales? Who are they? That's wizard whales. <laughs> it's the key selling one. point in all of his literature. <laughs> all right, we have two last questions here. If anyone else wants to get a question in, we are about to wrap up. So we are returning to our friend who got us started before Edie. Uh, this is, uh, what's your favorite subway train? Got a real New Yorker question in here. Um, my favorite subway train is, uh, without question, the G train. Um, and I'm a little bit partisan because I live in Brooklyn. Um, and the G train is one of those precious trains to me that um, does not go to Manhattan. It stays in the <laughs> outer boroughs and sort of it sort of orbits uh, um, from 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 Queens to Brooklyn. Um, it also passes over what I believe is the highest elevated point in the New York subway system, um, which is I think is um, I think it's Smith and Ninth Street, um, which is inc it's, it's 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 if you ever take it, it's elevated just like an absurdly tall distance um, uh, uh, above <laughs> above street level. Um, so it's very scenic, and there's very rarely a lot of people on the G train. Also, often there's, you can usually get a seat on it. Um, so I'm very fond of it. The the response from our question asker was, I also take the G with a lot of exclamation points. I will see <laughs> one I take the G all the time. I, I also take the G. <laughs> okay, uh, Josiah, age six again, says, do you think there'll be a movie version of the book? You know, it's such a good question. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I, I do a little screenwriting and I, and I actually, I was in Los Angeles and talking to people about it. And um, the truth is, I, I, I think that would be great. Um, and a couple of times people said, we would like to make a movie out of this. Um, and after a lot of talking, I decided that I wanted to write more books before we embarked on that. And I wasn't sure that the, people who asked me were the right partners to do it with me. Cause I feel like we'd only get one chance to do it in my head. It always looks very much like, um, there's a lot, a lot of it insp is inspired by, um, the movies of Miyazaki, um, Totoro and, uh, uh especially spirited away. Um, uh, I, I, I that sort of hand-drawn, uh, 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 that hand-drawn look, it's not sort of 3d computer animations. It's just sort of very sort of like a painting. Um, that's how I see it in my mind. And I feel as though if someone could put that on screen and make it look like that, um, I think that would be great, uh, but we'll see. Well, Miyazaki seems to continue to come out of retirement. <laughs> so anything is possible, Lev. You happen to be in the chat, Miyazaki. Um, <laughs> if you're out there, Maybe. just saying. Okay, this is our last question, and I want to say thank you so much, everyone, for your thoughtful questions. And uh, I love this one, so please, I also want to know, do you have any book recommendations? Hmm, that's such a good question, um, because I have uh, lots of book recommendations. Gosh, um, I guess I should keep it to sort of... Uh, um, Books in the age range of the uh, of the Silver Arrow. Um, to, to to rattle off a few, um, uh, uh, Catherine Valenti, um, the girl who circumnavigated Fairyland in a ship of her own making. The title is a mouthful, but if there is a living modern Lewis Carroll, um, it is definitely Catherine Valenti. I'm uh, I'm a huge fan of um, uh, the Olympians books by uh, George O'Connor. Um, which are retellings of Greek myths, but in a way that makes them even cooler than they already were. Um, uh, Nathan Hale's Hazardous Tales, uh, which are books of history, which are just, they're so funny. Uh, and you almost don't notice the fact that they are actually really good history. And you learn, I, everything I know about Napoleon comes from Nathan Hale's Hazardous Tales. They're so good. Um, anything else uh, I should throw in? Um, I, don't know. I think that's, that's all I've got, but, but 
um, I promise you those are those are winners. I, they are really special books. Yeah, we actually just hosted George O'Connor for his newest one, Dionysus. I bought a signed copy from uh -huh. him. Uh -huh. I'm thrilled seeing his um, signature there because I'm such a huge fan. Yeah, he, he's a great guy. And then, yeah, the, the Nathan Hale books, it's wild to me because, you know, most of the titles are, are conflicts, right? Like it's, it's a book on the Cold War or the Alamo. And you're like, why does a child want to read that graphic novel? Um, but ki kids love it, love it. Any, any way to get kids to read is never a bad thing. Um, all of the books that you've been mentioning, I have been putting in the chat for anyone who has said, what's that book that Lev Grossman was talking about? Um, but of course, don't forget, we are here to say, buy the Golden Swift, buy the Golden Swift at Greenlight, buy the Golden Swift with a nice signature on it. And did, did you say there's, there's a, an arrow in the Golden Swift as well as the Silver Arrow? <laughs> I should probably learn to draw a swift for the golden swift, but um, I'm still it sounds a little harder. So you will find in each one a badly drawn arrow. Um, that a is... badly drawn arrow. What Noah uh, cassowary drawings? Uh, not... <laughs> not yet. I'm working on it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Lev. Thank you, everyone who came tonight and for your thoughtful questions. This was a lot of fun. And I look forward to seeing you all again and seeing you here again, Lev, for your next book in a series of many books. Any parting words for us, Lev? Nope. Just thank you so much. It was, it was, <laughs> my book is now launched. This was the launch event. It's now... This, this is the book. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Have a good night.